Coming up in this episode... There's so much confusion over plant compounds. People think that they're actually a health benefit, whereas if you think about biologically what all these plant compounds do is they're, they're, they evolved to be toxic. <laughs> and so just piling on all of these plant compounds, eating the rainbow, um, may actually be creating its own stress level just as it is. Welcome to the HBMN Podcast. What we do with our bodies today becomes the foundation of who we are tomorrow. This is Health via Modern Nutrition. Amber, really great to have you on the HVMN podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. So one of the things that I saw as I was reviewing and preparing for this conversation was that you're also a computer scientist by background. And I think we're, you know, kidding around a little bit before, before we went live that my sense is that within recent years, I think the nutritional dogmas, I think really being reopened and reexamined. I think, and maybe this is, first person bias, but it seems like a lot of folks with perhaps engineering backgrounds who might not have come up with this standard nutritional dogma has been looking at the science and data from first principles and and, and following the data as, as like a true scientific approach rather than appeal to authority. And I know you've been looking at this for perhaps one of the longest, uh, especially on the carnivore side of things for over a decade. Um, what do you make of the recent interest in carnivore. I would say that within the last year or two, we'd had uh, kind of celebrity influencers, folks like the, you know, Jordan Peterson, Michaela Peterson, and other folks really like bringing it to the mainstream. And, and what do you make of this? Because I know from your background that you've been exploring this for over a decade. I do share your bias about um, the nutritional um, kind of science being dominated for a long time by just traditions that didn't necessarily have as much to do with the data that someone who's really an outsider like I am or like you might be um, can in certain ways see through to things that that the knowledge and the traditions might be obscuring. So I definitely <laughs> agree with that. As to the new recent upsurge in interest and popularity in the carnivore diet, it's been really fascinating. Uh, of course, I, I was excited to see a lot of people begin to get the benefits and to recognize that a keto diet doesn't have to conform to these preconceived, like, like to mesh with the current nutritional ideas about a plant-based diet being the best and then trying to line up the ketogenic benefits with the plant-based world, which is really, uh, of course it can be done, but it's it's almost like retrofitting something that wasn't necessary in the first place. Um, on the other hand, um, I think that the, now the, the people among whom a carnivore diet is very popular don't necessarily know that it has the history that it has. And it's also brought different populations. So I think when I was first starting a carnivore diet, and we called it ZC for zero carb back then, a lot of the people who got into it, myself included, started because of a kind of weight problem background. And now uh, I see a lot more people who are more into health optimization. They're younger. They are, they are might be um, into weightlifting or bodybuilding, and they just want, want to take their health up to an even higher level. So now we've got this mix of people who are basically healthy and want to find out what more they can do, and people who are sick and are seeing um, all these great benefits that people have been sort of accidentally finding over the years – um, and are getting into it because they think, oh, maybe this might help my chronic disease problem. Whereas back when when we started, when it was really uh, mostly people who were starting with weight problems, all these other things came about unexpectedly. So, for example, um, and we'll probably get into this at some point, but I had a mood disorder that was pretty serious. And when I started a carnivore diet, I had no expectation that my mood would be affected at all. That was just a surprise bonus side effect. Yeah, I think you hit a couple interesting threads. I think one, the notion of 
think what kind of intervention started people along this path from 10 years ago to today. I think what you mentioned was interesting was around how people are talking about a well-formulated ketogenic diet today. And I think you're absolutely right. Like my sense is that people are trying to mold towards traditional guidelines around green leafy vegetables and incorporating that as part of their high fat ketogenic diet to make it a little bit more palatable for the mainstream. And I'm, and I'm wondering how much of that is from first principles correct from data and how much is molding towards uh, the, the traditional food guidelines. And then I think the third part is, I, I'm curious to explore the, the performance angle of it and exactly, I think, why people are seeing success here. Because I think, and, and I think those are all three interesting areas. And and I think before diving into one of each of the three buckets, it might be helpful just to give our audience a quick synopsis of how you explored and and and, and dove into the ketogenic diet or, or the carnivore diet or zero carb diet, as you, you you know perhaps more rightly should call it, because that's the more original term. Um, how did you find about out about it in two thousand eight, two thousand nine? Um, were you low carb? Were you experimenting with other diets before entering and, and seeing success with zero carb? So my own personal way that I got here was all through the vanity of weight problems that I've had off and on since childhood. And um, my first approach when I when I first went to university, I gained a lot of weight suddenly. And my first idea was that I should be looking at going to a vegetarian diet uh, because that was what I was brought up with. I was brought up basically vegetarian. We had, um, I wasn't prevented from eating meat when I'd go to my grandmother's or out at a restaurant or something, but at home we had a, a, a vegetarian diet. So when I started having my own weight issues, I, I naturally just intuitively thought that that was the place that I should look. And it, it took me a few years of abject failure with that approach before I was able to actually even consider a low carb diet. I had heard of a low carb diet, um, but I thought it was just absolutely crazy. And I didn't really give it much of a chance actually right. intellectually at all. Um, because it just flew in the face of everything that I thought I knew. Right. And just to make sure we don't strawman the vegetarian diet, I'm, I'm sure it was a reasonable, sensible vegetarian diet. Or, or what were you eating on this, on your or on your aversion to a vegetarian diet? I was brought up with a very, um, a very conscientious vegetarian diet. So we had a variety of grains and legumes and many vegetables. We didn't eat any junk food or, or sugar type things. Um, I mean, I guess I had jam on my peanut butter sandwiches, but, it, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think um, I'm sure that there would be someone who would criticize what I was eating and say, well, if only you did it this way or that way. But, but I think I really did give it an honest try. Yeah, because I think when people describe a vegan or vegetarian diet, you could eat 300 Oreos a day and that's a vegan vegetarian diet, right? So I think... Just to make sure that we're steel manning the vegetarian side in, in, in your journey there, I wanted to make sure that it sounded like you were thoughtful around getting the enough proteins and, and, and the fat that you'd need to be actually functional. And I never actually did go low fat. I, I thought that the vegetarian fats were healthy fats and that they shouldn't be avoided. I was pretty sold for a little while on the idea that health problems were caused by animal foods qualitatively. Mm. Um, so that's where I was coming from. Got it. <laughs> so when I did eventually try the low carb diet, um, it happened. My my deciding to really look into it and give it a fair chance coincided with the publication of Mike and Mary Dan Ead's book Protein Power. So that was 1997, and I loved that book, and I still do love that book because it it really had a lot of scientific justification throughout it and many references and I went I even went to the library and photocopied many of the papers and read them very thoroughly and but ultimately the proof was in the the actual effect on my body so it, it just solved my weight problem very quickly and very effectively and I felt great and so low carb I I became kind of um <laughs> I wouldn't say a zealot, but you know how when you've discovered something new, 
you you get really into why it works and what's going on and figuring out where you went wrong in your previous thinking. So this wasn't quite zero carb yet, but this sounds like you reintroduced animal protein, but you still had some of your vegetables and other other compo- other you know non animal products as well. It was quite vegetable heavy actually at that time. I mean, I ate a lot of cruciferous, of course, and yep. a lot of salads, and I also made a lot of use of kind of comfort foods that were low carb renditions of previous things. So I used artificial sweeteners. I made things even out of um, st- uh, plant-based protein powders, not because they were plant-based, because they were convenient for making kind of mixes or protein drinks and things like that. And then in terms of low carb, were you trying to be ketogenic? Or were you measuring your blood ketones? Or was this, I mean, in terms of just like carb counts, were you targeting, you know, sub 100, sub 50? I was definitely counting carbs. So I got a handbook that I could look up all the different foods in and measure it. And my goal was to be under 25 grams a day. We didn't really have the ability to measure blood ketones at that time. Okay. So, but I, I had um, urine sticks, which I used to see if I was on track. <laughs> That's how long ago we're talking about. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I mean, a sub-25, I mean, presumably you're, you were in nutritional ketosis. I would think so. That's, that's a, a pretty proper low-carb ketogenic diet. Because I think within some of the medical literature, it's kind of funny to see that some articles will say, that 40% carbs is low carb diet or something. You know, you know it's like there's a range of carb consumption. It's like three, 30% is low carb. And it's like, well, low carb in the context of maybe the standard Western Central American diet, but by no means low carb when folks that are talking about keto are, are talking about low carb. So, it, yeah. okay, that's, that's, it, that's interesting. So it sounds like you had kind of, to me, it sounds like what would people today call a well-formulated ketogenic diet, which is you have the restriction of carbohydrates, sub 25 grams, but you still have a lot of like the leafy cruciferous vegetables that people like as, you know, the phytonutrients nutrients and the polyphenols that, you know, that people associate with, you know, longevity or hormesis or, or, or some mechanism of why that could be helpful for health and performance. Um, so it seemed like that helped and helped you reduce weight, but what was the trigger then to go one step further and especially at a time where this must have been quite counterintuitive because when I personally started looking into the ketogenic diet and fasting, this was like four or five years ago, the first Google result that came up for ketosis was ketoacidosis, <laughs> right? So this is like a very yeah. extreme form for type 1 diabetes of uncontrolled uh, ketogenesis where your blood goes acidic and that's not very good. So I'm sure... In 2008, 2009, as you were doing your research and talking to folks, this must have been completely insane in, in, within the literature, or at least within the broader community of, of like just popular sentiment. Yes. So when I started the low carb diet in in the late 90s, there was still a lot of influence from Atkins, and there was still um, a perception that a low carb diet would have to be meat heavy and fat heavy. And I think that a lot of the um, the kind of rebranding of Atkins started happening. If you look at the progression from, say, there's a, there's a book in 1972 that was by Atkins, and I think that might be the, the original one. And there was a very limited amount of vegetables if you were in the sort of, uh, I think they called it phase one or induction phase. Um, and then the second book came out, maybe, I don't remember the exact timeline, but maybe 10 years later, and they had a slightly more liberal version of vegetables. But by the time the new Atkins for a New You book came out, um, they were actually pushing, actively pushing vegetables and saying that you had to have vegetables as part of your diet. So the the zeitgeist had really changed. And um, the the kind of myths about the low carb diet had changed too. So I think in the earlier days, people were really worried about protein for your kidneys. And I think that you know that's that's definitely been disproven as an area of concern. It still persists a little, but the myths about what vegetables are necessary for or what uh, a low carb diet might do to you <laughs> have moved on to more cardiovascular things or things about hormones, the thyroid cortisol, stuff like that. Um, So I had been doing this diet for a good dozen years. And the thing is that 
my weight had started to creep up again. Mm. And there may be a variety of reasons for that. Um, for example, well, it could just be that I was getting older, right? I don't know what effect that has. I had had two children. I'd gained weight during the pregnancies and not um, ever each time I didn't go back to exactly the state of weight that I'd been before. And then there's also the question of the antidepressants that I'd been on because I had been diagnosed with depression when I was 20. Mm. So I'd been basically on antidepressants for a very long time <laughs> since before my low carb diet. So for whatever reason, my weight had been creeping up, even though I continued to stay on a low carb diet and, and still was reading more about it all the time and feeling more and more certain that what I was doing was healthy for me. Yet my weight was going up by the time the end of 2008 came around, I was weighing probably 200 pounds. I had stopped weighing at my last recorded weight was 196 and it was just too depressing to even continue to look at. Right. Um, but I was feeling increasingly confused and desperate and looking for a solution and reading about things and thinking, you know, maybe there's something wrong with my thyroid or maybe I'm not getting enough of, um, I don't know, some thing like creatine or whatever the, the latest supplement I was reading about, or maybe I had a candida infection and the theories, there were so many theories, and I, I spent an embarrassing amount of money on different supplements, um, really to no avail, just trying to figure out what the heck was wrong with me. So that's the frame of mind I was in when I found this forum that where people were not eating any plants at all, um, which before that moment in time, I might have dismissed in the same way that I dismissed the low carb diet originally, because even though I had been pretty sold on the idea that a low carb diet was good for your health, I still had all of that background of believing in the healthfulness of vegetables. But a lot of the people that were on those forums had a similar background to me. So they, they were just, they were stalled out on low carb for whatever reason. And when they tried this zero carb diet, it was not only helping them break through those stalls, but they were finding unexpected, interesting benefits. The The forum itself was called Zeroing In on Health. And I think, you know, I appreciated it at the time, but it took me a while for it to fully sink in that all the people who were there, um, whether or not they started with a weight problem, they were staying there for health reasons. They were finding that it actually surprisingly benefited their health in some way or other. So it wasn't just a short-term intervention. This was an overall upgrade in their lifestyle post-correction of some initial weight problem or some initial acute thing that they wanted to resolve. That was what was happening. Although mm -hmm. for me, I, I, I fully admit that my idea when I finally decided, yeah, I think I might try this, was an extremely <laughs> temporary idea. I thought, I'm going to try this, but... I had no expectation that 10 years down the road, I'd be talking about still being on this diet, like three weeks I was going to do. <laughs> yep. And I thought, you know, that will probably have some effect on my weight. And, and then maybe um, when I get back to the weight that I want, I'll, I can go back to my regular low carb maintenance diet. But of course, that's not what happened. <laughs> how was those three weeks? And how did this turn into a 10 year N equals one. Well, the first thing that happened was I realized that I, it, it was really psychologically intimidating, which is kind of funny me, to me now because it's just the way I eat and it, it seems really normal. But I remember very clearly, and I try to keep this in mind when I talk to people who haven't heard of it, that the idea of not having anything on my plate but meat was just so foreign and intimidating to me that it took me about three weeks to kind of psych myself up to the commitment to do it. <laughs> um, and in fact, I, I took the, so I took the first three weeks of January, 2009 to really clean up my low carb diet, make sure I was doing it exactly right. Like I counted, even though I'd been doing it for a dozen years and I felt like I was pretty comfortable with how much carbs were in everything. I measured everything again, counted everything again, just to make sure that I wasn't you know, suffering from some kind of carb creep or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then at the end of the three weeks, I jumped in and I mostly was just eating steak because, you know, it's just three weeks and why not just 
do the most enjoyable thing I can do. Um, and what happened was I immediately, first of all, started losing weight extremely rapidly, like a pound every other day, which was, of course, uh, exciting and fun. <laughs> um, and it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. And I also noticed that my mood was better. Um, of course, when you start to lose weight or you know, achieve any goal that you haven't been able to achieve, that's going to boost your mood. Yep. But I felt like it was qualitatively different. Um, one thing that I haven't talked about yet so far today is that not only was I suffering from depression, but over the years, my diagnosis changed from major depressive disorder, treatment resistant, meaning the drugs weren't really helping, to a form of bipolar disorder called mm. type 2 bipolar and the difference between that and um, regular manic depression is that I never had true manias. So I would have um, infrequent short periods of what they call hypomania, which is what it looks like if you have manic depression when you're about to go into like a psychotic break and become manic. But that latter part never would happen to me. I would just then crash and go back into depression, which was my more normal <laughs> state. Um so my mood was good, but I wasn't really sure what to think about that. But I did happen to mention it to my husband at the time. And he he stopped what he was doing and, and gave me a very serious look and said, you know, I didn't know how to bring this up with you, but your mood, you seem so much more stable now than you've ever been since I've ever known you and we'd been together for like 10 years at that point yep. um so that was you know i realized something serious might be going on here um of course you can't get to a big conclusion on just two weeks of um feeling good when you've got this long history of fluctuating moods that cross time i didn't think at that time oh my bipolar's cured the promising little blip and i think that's the sensible thing to do right like don't over fit the data of two weeks given a, you know, a dozen, like a dozen years. Right. But that was definitely our first clue that there was something different going on. Mm -hmm. And as time went on and there was a bit of a complication because uh, a few weeks later I found out I was pregnant with my third child. And um, even though I felt very comfortable with the medical knowledge about the safety of the carnivore diet and a ketogenic diet, I didn't stay ketogenic throughout that pregnancy for a variety of reasons. But after the baby was born, I went right back on the carnivore diet. And um, well, there was actually a really neat uh, coincidence there that was lucky for me. And that's that because I was pregnant, I had to stop all my medication. Mm. So I went off the medication that I was using for the bipolar and for the safety of the baby. And then after the baby was born, I, I, w I was going to be breastfeeding, so I didn't start it again then either. But I restarted the diet, and it had the same stabilizing, uplifting effect on my mood then that it did at the beginning. And I just never needed to go back and have any prescriptions renewed. So the, the bottom line is that I've been off psychiatric meds for 10 years um, after having a, a disease that was progressing and, and was crippling me. Fascinating. That's in that's incredible. So stepping in and, and, and looking at what happened or, or with the low carb versus the carnivore diet, do you have some suspicion what, you know, quote unquote, went wrong with just a, the kind of the standard ketogenic approach? I mean, I think... It seems like there's two main mechanisms of actions going on. I think ketosis and upregulating all the different metabolic pathways that, that, that triggers when ketosis occurs is one probably dominant mechanism. And, th but, and that would carry through a well-formulated or a plant-included ketogenic diet as well as a carnivore diet. But I sus suspect that there was something in terms of potentially like an autoimmune development that you were getting autoimmune issues or, or, or some other effect that the elimination diet of the carnivore diet unlocked? Like, what is your suspicion there? I mean, I think it's like, those are probably the two main clues of 
why these things could work. I, I'm curious if you have other hypotheses or explanations of how you think uh, the transition really flipped the switch, not in just reversing the, I guess the, the, I guess the slow, I guess reversal of the benefits you got from a ketogenic diet, and then something really astounding happened with the with the mood and in in the in the neurological side as well. I had many theories throughout the years, and yeah. and I still don't really know exactly, but I'll tell you the different things that I thought about. So, yeah. uh, at first, the first thing that I I kind of dismissed pretty early on was the idea that it was just about the amount of carbohydrate and therefore the depth of ketosis. But the problem with that theory is that um, protein affects ketosis, right? So the, um, I do think people go a little overboard on their understanding of protein being bad for ketosis, but there's definitely some level somewhere where too much protein will take you out and there's a, a continuum between the depth of ketosis you're going to get into with a lower protein and a higher protein, low carb diet. And the, the diet that I was eating was definitely on the higher end of the protein range. Mm -hmm. So later on, when I, when I started measuring ketones and such, I knew that I was in ketosis at the, like the one millimole level, but that's not, um, I don't think that the ketosis and the carbs itself was the, the major difference for me. Um, a second theory that I had for a little while is that I had some kind of a um, microbial infection, like maybe a fungus or or um, a bacteria or candida or something that was affecting my mood, um, and that somehow I was starving them out by not giving them the, um, the again the level of carbohydrate, like gosh, I'm so sensitive to carbohydrates that even the amount in lettuce is going to feed these microbes. Right. One of, one of the reasons I decided um, that that might not be it is because there was a certain point where that was so strongly my theory that I thought, I've got to really kill these buggers off while they're down. And so I, I bought a whole bunch of different uh, candida supplements that were supposed to attack... Um, the candida uh, infection. And within about a week of taking these, some of them included um, plant herbal concoctions like uh, oil of oregano and um, garlic. And um, it's hard to say because I started taking them all at the same time, but I actually had for the first time a recurrence of uh, depression. Hmm. Um, it took it took a, a, about a week of taking these supplements, and one day I found myself lying on my bed, looking up at the ceiling and thinking I would be better off and the world would be better off if I weren't alive. And then wow. I suddenly went, oh my God, I've been here before. <laughs> What's going on? This, yeah. is, <laughs> this is not normal. And, and I made the connection to the things I was taking, and I immediately stopped them, and within about two days, that that sensation went away. And so then I thought, wow, this is really serious and it has something to do with actual plants themselves. <laughs> and that was, I think, the really, really the first time that even though, you know, it seems really obvious, you take away the plants, then it must be something about the plants. <laughs> but, right. but that was the first time that I really deeply considered that. And, you know, the paleo tradition has a lot of literature about autoimmune diseases and the c contribution of lectins, for example, and how they get through the gut barrier and trick it into um, making a gut permeable. And I had never really given that much credence for two reasons. One is that I'd been on a low-carb diet for a dozen years, and so I wasn't eating grains or legumes, which are the major source of those kinds of compounds that are supposed to do this. And secondly, I didn't see my disorder as a form of an autoimmune disorder, which now I think might actually be more the case. I think that the scope of what we call autoimmune and the scope of what can happen if you have permeable, inappropriately permeable membranes could in quite easily include things like depression. Yeah, I think that's an interesting vein that I want to explore a little bit more because when I talk to carnivores, and, and these are folks that have 
been on Carnivore much shorter than you, maybe a year, a couple years. I think one of the main routes that they find Carnivore is through leaky gut, uh, gut permeability. They have gut issues and it's affecting, obviously, you know, diarrhea, all of that stuff. But like the broader, I think, quote unquote, autoimmune issues, eczema, skin rashes, maybe some neurological effects. And to me, it's that it makes sense if people have autoimmune issues towards something in plants like polyphenols, some of these plant molecules, that makes sense. But to, but to me, is that is do you think that autoimmunity issues are becoming more prevalent in modern society? I mean, it because I think just as I think animal consumption has been a part of all of human history, I think there's always been some history of plant consumption as well. And to me, it seems like that we wouldn't evolve that behavior of just plant consumption of everyone had some sort of autoimmunity. And I think there probably is some, obviously some individual variation on tolerability of plant polyphenols. Uh, my simple observation is this. I'm curious if you think that, or if you see something like this as well, is there something with the modern environment, the modern, whether that's chemical pollution or with our food environment today, that's increasing sensitivity to lectins, increasing sensitivity to, to some of these uh, compounds in plants. I mean, what do you make of uh, kind of the recent success that people are finding in carnivore. Well, I want to draw a bit of a parallel between low carb and carbohydrates and carnivore and plants because uh, even though I have a pretty strong suspicion that a lot of our evolutionary history was somewhat low in carb, I agree with you that plants have probably been some part of our diet for all along um, except for pockets of time where where we may not have. But um, if you, th if you think about people who have metabolic syndrome or diabetes, for example, clearly, I think that it, it's very clear anyway that the best treatment you can possibly do if you have diabetes is avoid carbohydrates. But on the other hand, I do not think that the idea that carbohydrates cause diabetes is very well supported at all because you can even you don't even have to look – very far back in history, you can just even look at other parts of the world right now where there are people who are eating high carb diets and they don't have a problem with diabetes or metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. So clearly the carbohydrates themselves aren't causing the problem. And we should, as humans, be able to have a high tolerance for a high carbohydrate diet. Yet, if you have diabetes, once you're there, it seems like there's no, there's no going back. You can put all of that disease into remission, many people completely normalize their glucose levels, even get their insulin levels back down and avoid all of the horrible complications that can happen if you have diabetes. But if you give them a potato, they have diabetic responses to it immediately, right. um, which is not normal. Yep. And I think I think the same thing is, the same kind of logic can be applied to the carnivore diet. I think it's absolutely not normal for someone not to be able to tolerate some plants in their diet. Yep. Um, this is not, um, I don't, I don't think it's the case that you, I don't think you can make a good argument that humans just don't, aren't cut out to digest any plants, but there seem to be a lot of people who are at the point where they're just not tolerating them and it's causing disease symptoms that can go away if you take it away. And whether you whether that ends up being something that we want to umbrella as autoimmune or what, what the actual cause or mechanistic problem or what diseases are going to fall under that, that may be less clear. But I think it's I think it's really clear that it's causing people more people problems than it ever has before. Yeah, I think we can explore this part as well, which is like carnivore being an optimal diet, which I think is probably a little bit more speculative. And, and, and I think there needs to be more studies and evidence there. But I think you put it quite nicely that it it's probably not an ideal state to be so sensitive to plant compounds. And I think from my experience, I... I've tried, you know, for the six week blocks of carnivore, I, I do blocks of like low carb ketogenic diet with, with plants. I, I have just normal windows of just eating normal food. And I feel like 
I, I, I think I'm just relatively lucky in the sense that like my performance levels are in my general mood and happiness are relatively the same as long as I get some exercise into, I think, make sure I use up all the energy substrate. So my perspective on this is almost focus on metabolic flexibility and being able to process all the substrates well. And it sounds like when people are focused on specific eliminations of certain dietary groups or, or, or types of substrate, that's could induce specific adaptations that optimize certain pathways that people want to focus on for potentially performance benefits or adaptation benefits. But it seems like there's an increased uh, impaired state where people lose the ability to process, whether that's carbohydrate, as you said, for uh, folks with type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome, or I think what we're seeing with autoimmunity, which I think you put quite nicely, and I think that's a really you know, well-articulated analog, there seems to be an uptick in autoimmune issues with lectins or plant compounds. I mean, and my, my only guess there is that, is there something with the food environment or our modern environment or the types of food that we're eating that are triggering this? I mean, do you have any suspicion or ideas of why this is happening? Or is this always has happened and people just didn't realize it? And people are just like, oh, I just have like gut issues and I just kind of feel bad. And I didn't realize that not eating plants made me feel better. So I guess there's there's two options, which is that there's something that's modern that's changed or something relatively recent that's changing our uh, acceptance of plant compounds, or it has always been the case, but we've been, but it's, it's more important not to starve, therefore eat some plants than only eat meat, which is, I think, as you mentioned, uh, probably the preferred, more, most nutritionally dense form of food that would be readily available. And I think one of the things that has always struck me as funny was that the modern fruits and vegetables never existed in nature. I mean, these are Frankenstein, very plump, seedless, beautiful <laughs> fruits. And if you look at like the ancient apple or the ancient orange, these are tiny, very, very low on, you know, free sugar, kind of sour, sour fruits. But I think it's a kind of, kind of, like, at least gives a hint that there's maybe something with the modern food environment that's triggering some of these autoimmune issues. So I want to throw it back at you to, you know, you know, digest or break down some of the, the, the points I brought up there. But before you answer that question, let's take a quick break. Now you've already heard about Keto Collagen Plus, but how is it being used within our community? Balancing my personal health, maintaining my business, it's a lot on my plate. And when you're active like I am, you really need to take care of your body. It's called Keto Collagen Plus. It's by HVMN. It's a collagen product that has MCTs built in. As we get older, we lose the natural collagen that's in our bodies. It does help your hair, your skin, your nails, but it's really good for your joint health. There's no gluten, no sugar, and no dairy. Really high quality collagen in here, really high quality MCT powder in here. So easy, so delicious. Totally, totally give this one a whirl. One distinction that we might want to make is whether the effect is something that's kind of gradual and like, for example, is it the case that, that plants are always a little bit damaging and the more you have, the more likely you're going to be damaged? Or is there some kind of a thresholding effect coming into play where um, you, you're basically able to cope with plants and then suddenly something happens and now you're not? And well, they're not necessarily completely mutually exclusive, but I have a suspicion that um, the thresholding effect might be coming into play more, especially if there's some kind of a, an accumulated damage. And I do think you're right that it, that there are things beyond food that could be contributing to that. Um, there could be, you know, just toxins in the environment. There may be um, more exposure to Gosh, I don't know, and I'm I'm speculating here, but things like heavy metals. But then there there also has been, I think, a huge um, a huge increase. Um, I don't have real statistics on it, but my perception, even from the nearly half of a century that I've been alive, is that the that the amount of vegetables and fruits at, and the timing that people are eating is just off the scales. <laughs> like I, I, I have the perception and maybe it's wrong that when I was a child, my family accepted most people were eating meat and potato and, and maybe a side of veg. Whereas now you, you can go and get something like, I don't know, kale smoothies and eat them every day. And, and just the, the, 
something that we might have tolerated in a small amount is suddenly overwhelming the system if you're mm. throwing because people think that <laughs> there's so much confusion over plant compounds people think that they're actually a health benefit um whereas if you think about biologically what all these plant compounds do is they're they're they evolved to be toxic <laughs> and so just piling on all of these plant compounds, eating the rainbow, um, may actually be creating its own stress level just as it is. Yeah, I don't know if I have a strong conclusion or opinion around this, which is plant compounds evolving as toxins. But I've heard other uh, folks, scientists, academics, claim or make the argument that these are hermetic uh, compounds. The notion of hormesis, something that doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. And we just had Professor David Sinclair, who, you know, uses the term xenohormesis, which is like, this is some sort of like in, interspecies communication of stress, where the plant is stressed and it produces things like resveratrol and other polyphenols. It somehow, when a human consumes it, it triggers some of the stress adaptation pathways. So that would be like the, I guess, the steel man argument of why people would argue that, yes, you know, there, there's probably multiple a very complicated reason why these polyphenols evolved in the first place. But could the toxin in the right dose be beneficial? And I think for me, yeah. it's the, the literature is not conclusive. I, that, like That's where I'm at. I gave a talk about that this year at, at uh, Low Carb Salt Lake. Uh, <laughs> I didn't title it Hormesis. I titled it something about um, uh, plant and animal food benefits. But but the, what what I came up with when I was researching for that talk is basically, I mean, you're correct that, that the stress level that's it's stress that's being communicated when you eat these plant compounds. And so there are a couple different things that you have to keep in mind when you're talking about stress. So stress means that there's this toxin that's coming in and your body says, oh my gosh, there's a toxin. We have to upregulate our ability to deal with stress. And the idea of hormesis is that the amount that you upregulate the, that response actually outweighs the toxic insult that came along with it in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two things that um, I think are important when you're thinking about this. One is the dose. And it turns out that a few of these compounds have actually been found to be clinically viable. Most of them have not, actually. But a few like resveratrol, um, uh, sulforaphane, um, curcuminoids have efficacy, but only when they've been isolated and concentrated to way beyond food dosages. So already we're talking about something that's medicine and not that you would necessarily see as an effect if you were just eating it in the wild per se. Yep. The second is... And you could also maybe class a metformin in that yes. category because that, that, that comes from a plant, like a willow bark Absolutely. tree. And caffeine and nicotine, all of these actually... Um, work somehow or other through the AMPK pathway. Yep. Um, so, <laughs> and that should give us a clue, right? Because if you're on a ketogenic diet, your AMPK PK pathway is already way ramped up. So the, the kind of the effect that those plant compounds are giving you, if you're on a high carb diet is that they're, they're forcing a pathway that would never be active when you're on a high carb diet. Um, so, it may give some added benefit that there's no way to get when you're a high carb. But if you're on a ketogenic diet, it's really unclear <laughs> whether there's any extra added benefit from stimulating AMPK when you're already doing that through ketosis. And the when there's a paper and I'm I'm spacing on the name of the first author. I'm pretty sure that uh Jeff Bullock was one of the authors. Um, they looked at the the oxidation and antioxidant response to a ketogenic diet in rodents. And what they basically see happening is when you first go on a ketogenic diet, you get the same stress response that you would to these plant toxins. And so you see um, you see oxidation levels go up 
and you see an antioxidant, endogenously created antioxidant response in tandem with that, just like hormesis. But then what happens is over time through keto adaptation, the endogenous antioxidant levels stay up and the oxidation, detectable oxidation levels go down. Hmm. And so if you're in this keto adapted state, I think that it's really questionable whether whether now adding a hormetic kind of dose, which we already don't even know what that dose is, is going to help you. And the danger is that you over-toxify. So even in some of the literature that talks about how these things, um, these toxins can help with, say, cancer, it's also known that at past a certain point, if you try to use those very same uh, polyphenols or whatever is they're specifically using, it actually increases the cancer rather than helping it. And so it's a very delicate balance. Yep. I agree with what you said there. I think the nuance is dose and then the specific individual, what kind of baseline state are they in to be able to receive a hermetic shock, right? Because I think an exercise for me is if I'm metabolically healthy, it's going to be adaptative in a good way for me. But if you have an issue with exercise, if there's an injury or some other impairment, then forcing someone to run a half marathon is probably going to be detrimental to them. So I think even from that analogy, if we can look at hormesis in general, exercise, for example, can be considered hormesis, um, different types of diets. And then when we're talking specifically on plant polyphenols, I think if we look at it from that lens, I think it, it makes sense. And it sounds like we kind of agree that there is potentially use cases or there are for sure use cases that we've seen helpful. But I think just to give a broad sweep that all of them are helpful, I think is overly crude. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of exercise, one thing that I learned recently is that if you give exogenous vitamin C with the hope of, uh, you know, reducing oxidation because it's an antioxidant, it's been shown that the at the adaptations, the positive benefit of exercise are taken away if you give too much uh, vitamin C. So, you know, if you, you can't necessarily predict what kind of effect you're going to get when you start messing around with doses of things that you wouldn't naturally get. I think that's one thing that I've just come to appreciate more and more. And perhaps with a computer science background, you, you have a similar lens here, which is that this is a very complicated systems network. And if you push on one node, it impacts all the other nodes very, very intricately, right? So it's not just like turn up vitamin C and instantly that's like the one thing that you want. It's just like that. there's like some homeostatic function that I think all life is trying to maintain some balance. And once you artificially jack up one side, you're affecting 17 other pathways. And it's hard to predict how that all happens, right? I think you kind of tease upon this with a ketogenic diet. You're not just increasing ketones and reducing carbs, which reduces insulin, you're also hitting AMPK. You're hitting potentially the NAD, NADH ratio. You're, hit, you're hitting all of these metabolic pathways that are people are now studying individually for longevity or health span effects. And I think you see that some of these primal interventions like fasting, like keto, like, and I think carnivores like a more extreme or more restricted version of keto are hitting a lot of the pathways in like the way that you'd want to control them, right? Like I think if you would want to be very crude, you'd want AMPK to be upregulated because I think it's associated with a lot of good adaptations for increased mitochondrial gen biogenesis, increased, and that's associated with longevity, right? So I think it's interesting that some of the primal interventions seem to hit the system much more completely than just like a spot. Like I'm going to take a rapamycin to inhibit mTOR. I'm going to take a metformin just to try to bump up AMPK. I think that's an excellent point. And coming from <laughs> you, know, coming from a background of psychiatric illness, it it reminds me a lot of the way that psychiatric medicines work. So you've got you've got this living home, homeostatic system, like you say, right? And if you just try to to intervene at one specific pathway, everything's going to fight to go back to where it was supposed to be. So I was taking serotonin reuptake inhibitors for a while, right? And and I'm quite certain that my body quickly worked its way around that so that it was no longer effective. But 
uh, on the other hand, now I've got all these knock on consequences of, of the system having to work around it, which I think is where side effects come from. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, I don't want to get into a naturalistic fallacy, but there are, (laughs) there are reasons that your body would get into a ketogenic state, um, that come are about in a sense that pulls in a lot of things that are synergistically working together to get you into that state. So if you're fasting, I think that, I think that's, that's a very natural, so to speak, way to be in ketosis. And it's unlikely that there's going to be parts of your body that are fighting against it. But if you just say, take uh, ketones in a salt or ester form, uh, that's, that. I would expect that to be very confusing to your body. Why do I have high glucose and high ketones? What's going on? And and I don't think it's going to have, even if it's going to have some some positive effects, I'm sure it does. The literature shows it does on yeah. something like cognition. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you've got your body working together in a safe, effective way. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously exogenous ketones and ketone esters are a specific area of interest of mine. And I think that there definitely is like an interesting question around, I think the performance use cases are pretty, I think there's a robust building block of evidence there, but I think you're asking the right question. Is this, is this a, this is a novel physiological state to have high ketones and high carbohydrate potentially at the same time. And my way of thinking about it is that it's, similar in terms of just energy substrate overload in general. If you're just eating a lot of fat and a lot of sugar at the same time, that's probably not a good state. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend just eat a lot of ketones, a lot of carbs, and a lot of fat at the same time. But if you're actually balancing right. it properly, it, it, it's like, to me, it's just like it were uh, a ketone ester is almost opening up a, just an additional nutritional lever that has different properties than carb, fat, protein. And you just have like yes. some way to just ingest ketones directly. And I also think it can be an excellent way to bootstrap. Um, or if there's some reason, for example, if if you've got a problem releasing uh, fat from your adipocytes, um, having a boost of even extra fat, let alone extra ketones, can help you help your body start to recognize the signals of the state that you're trying to do it trying to get it into yep. as long as you're not crossing the signals too much. Yeah. It's like, there's nothing that's I think is magical, right? I think when people make overly broad claims where I've seen different publications literally say, this is Kim Kardashian's keto diet in a bottle. Just drink this and you're going to melt fat off your body. It's like, no, it's not that simple. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, we wish you could just like turn these things that uh, they're, everything is just more complicated. And I, and I, I think, I think that's like, I think, the more and more you dive in, the more and more you realize that the, I think it's like the, it's a very similar journey where you think the nutrition should be settled. It's one of the most, it's, everyone has an opinion on it because everyone eats and it seems like it should, should, should be something that's like understandable. But I think even today, it's just like, no one knows what to eat. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like literally, I think, the New York, I think I'm curious to get your thoughts on some of the recent developments where like the New York Times had that big article around, oh, red meat might not be as bad as we had, you know, recommended for the last 20, 30 years. So I think from that perspective, and this might tie into the larger trend around which institutions to even trust. I don't want to become too conspiracy theory, but I just see a kind of a broader trend towards um People really just wanting to understand the tr- broad data, the, the evidence in of itself, because I think we've, I think just within the lens of nutrition, I think we've seen issues with the, the broad stroke guidelines. And I think that little lens for me is opening up my questioning of just broader institutional uh, interpretation of knowledge. And I think perhaps some areas are a little bit more robust than others, right? I think politics and, and, and news is one where your people are living in parallel realities. Let's not get into politics, but I think that might be something salient that a lot of people can kind of intuit where our notion of what is real news and fake news is like, people are not even talking on the same planet anymore. And I think yeah. nutrition is like, I think a more sensible maybe way to talk about this topic. But I think there's definitely some sort of 
maybe broader cultural trend as well that nutrition is just a small part of. I was really happy to see those particular criticisms of the recommendations. I know that it caused quite a <laughs> kafaw yeah. in the community, but but I think what what was what's really finally being acknowledged is that a lot of the methods that are being used to implicate certain nutritional things in chronic disease, we just don't have enough of the right kind of evidence to make those kinds of firm statements of causality. And the the sad thing about it is that uh, I think, <laughs> well, I was going to make a parallel. Um, maybe I'll just go ahead and do it. When I was when I was in school in high school, we got education about um, drugs, uh, illicit drugs being bad for you. And because there's this idea that all drugs are bad for you, um, things like heroin would be equated with marijuana and with alcohol. And I think it's very clear um, if you are a teenager who's experimenting with marijuana, that the dangers are being exaggerated and therefore it breaks your trust. And so I saw people in my cohort who would get into very hard, very dangerous drugs based on the lack of trust in the people who are teaching them about drugs. And so I think that the nutritional world is in a similar kind of situation where we have all these medical victories that should be taken seriously, like, um, like, uh, the discovery of germs that led to antibiotics and to vaccines is a huge benefit and win for mankind. <laughs> but now when you see uh, people making claims about red meat causing heart disease with the same confidence level that that they are making about vaccines, uh, it, it breaks down trust in a way that, that makes it hard to tell if anything is correct. And, and so... The only real way, I think, to understand it, unfortunately, is to delve into the actual science, uh, but not everyone has the interest or the background or the ability to evaluate, like, are, is this statistical method actually enough to get the kind of confidence that we want or not? It's subtle. Even for me with a math background, I don't know all the ins and outs of how of epidemiological adjustments for different factors uh, but what I do know is that you can't <laughs> you can't prove causality by looking at a whole bunch of people of from a pretty homogenous grain-based diet and then draw conclusions about their biomarkers that would apply to mine. Yeah, associational studies should be about hypothesis generation and not causality claims, right? I think that's the original purpose of associational or epidemiology. And I think that's where I think the line gets confusing where the news headlines want that wants that one sentence headline that's like eggs are bad for you or chocolate's yeah. good for you and it's like ah i mean and i think and i think that's and uh, my sense is that I, I i think you're right in the sense that i think each participant in this current ecosystem is doing this in good faith they want to give their best practical guideline and i think they're they think they're doing the right thing but i think when you lack the nuance of actually explaining all the caveats of how you came to that conclusion, I think that's where it might be an arrogance thing or overconfidence thing where it's like, no, just trust me. I'm smarter than you. Like, like this is <laughs> kind of like the way you should do it. And it doesn't, and it doesn't have enough of the caveats or edge cases that would make that conversation a lot more trustworthy. Right. I think maybe that's a cultural thing. Cause I think, my sense is that, you know, when you talk to an authority figure, maybe a generation ago, like a doctor or a lawyer or a politician, it's like, okay, this is the like the news anchor. This is like a trusted authority. Like I'm going to listen and sort of comply and, and follow their guidance. But I feel like maybe something with the culture today, it's much more of a dialogue where don't just tell me what to do. Like I, I, I want to believe you, but also explain a little bit of why you're telling me to do this. And I feel like that might be just kind of a recent cultural shift perhaps with the emergence of the internet, with people's ability to actually tap into the raw papers themselves, right? Because I think 50 years ago, you, I, I, you and I couldn't go look at the same papers that the academics were looking at, right? You needed to have like a university card, maybe look up the the journal in the library or maybe look up the like the microfiches of the, like the scanned copies of the papers originally. But now like, the world's literature is at our fingertips. So I think the democratization of access has 
change the conversation from let me just listen to what the you know the higher ups tell me what to do. Now it's like okay, I'm I'm happy to listen and take that you know more educated or more maybe you spent more time thinking about this. But I can also look at the data myself in, in gut check. Right. You know, I got the idea from uh, Gary Taubes, actually, that this is more acute in the medical community in particular. And he argues that this is because uh, medicine came through military. Hmm. And so you had you had medical experts who who were also command and control style, you know, like you're in an emergency situation. I'm the head doctor. I'm going to tell you what to do. And um, a lot of the same that same culture became part of the medical education, um, even when we're talking about research, uh, where where you don't have that kind of emergency. We're in the hospital and we have to make a decision whether it's the right one or not. That's interesting from a cultural perspective, but I don't want to, you know, poo-poo or, or, or bash too hard on on the current system. I think again, I think you're right exactly on the sense that germ theory vaccinations, all these things have literally improved and extended health and, 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 and happiness of, of mankind. I think let's help improve the conversation quality and move everything forward, right? Like I don't, I don't think it's like rip everything down. We don't trust anything. Like there's absolutely legit science and technologies and medicines that actually work. Let's focus and double down on that. And I think at the edges, especially around diet, where it goes from I think it's like fairly interdisciplinary. I think hopefully there's more progress made there. Um, how do you envision the space moving forward? Because I think 10 years ago, you probably had like this weird online community that those people were the only ones talking about it. I think four or five years ago, keto is, I would say, Still controversial, but I would say that most people have probably heard of the notion, like the word keto, or like a good substantial of the mainstream have. I think large part, you have celebrities talking about their diet, seeing some success there. Um, in my sense is that carnivore is on that same trajectory. I think someone like yourself proves the counterexample that you're not going to die <laughs> on a carnivore diet, so I think hopefully the, the 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 downside is move towards um, this is not going to kill you in a year. Like you're not going to die of scurvy, right? Like you, you haven't died of scurvy yet. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm curious, what do you think are the catalysts that might trigger a broader examination around carnivore? Maybe it's already happening with people talking about it. Maybe it's more studies. It sounds like folks are trying to do more formalized studies on the carnivore diet. What do you think are the uh, catalysts that you see coming down in the, in the next few years here? Even in my personal life, I'm beginning to meet people who know the word carnivore. And, you know, like even just two years ago, if I wanted to explain to someone, if it came up how I eat, it, it they really, it really took a lot to wrap their head around the idea of what I was trying to say. And now yeah. they're like, oh, you mean carnivore? Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's really astonishing. Um, I think that we're getting movement because um, some people have been are, – are publishing books. Sean Baker's book just came out. Um, as, in terms of scientific study, I'm a little bit more um, – uh, cynical about that mm. just because of what I've seen in the ketogenic world. I mean, when I, when I found out about low carb diets back in the nineties, I was so blown away with the amount of literature that we already had about the potential of this, that I thought, gosh, in five years, the whole world is going to know about low carb and is going to, you know, be positive for this as a as a therapy and a way of life. And of course, that that still really hasn't happened, even though a lot of people know about keto. Yeah. Um. And and part of it is that I I think it's hard to get funding. Um, certainly, there's no not necessarily any pharmaceutical that you could um, use as a point of interest to study carnivore with. Um, there, I, I think ketosis has been driven by, um, department of defense grants where they they actually do want to look at optimization under, particularly under harsh conditions like low oxygen or, uh, traumatic brain injury type situations. Something we're very familiar with. Yep. Right. Um, whereas 
I I still haven't come up with ideas where um, a body like that who would be interested in funding a lot of studies would want to go the carnivore route. Um, I would love to see people looking at it for, well, uh, of course, my, my heart is deeply into the psychiatric problems because I know the, the stress that that causes not just uh, an individual but their entire family when you have that kind of problem. Um, but I'm not sure what the best way to incentivize that would be. And, and I think that getting the incentives right is the right way to move things forward. Yeah, I think that sounds about right in, in my estimation as well, where I think it's very hard to fund nu nutrition studies because no one can patent it and make money off of it, right? There's just some capitalism forces even in in, in science, and whether it's for a good or bad, it's just how it works. Um, I'm curious to explore a little bit on the performance side. I think, I think the cons I, again, I think with the examples of people that have been on carnivore for decades, like yourself, and 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 and, and I think it's not even n equals one. I think there's been good historical literature on certain populations being heavily carnivorous. I think we can hopefully move the conversation that, you know, it's not going to kill you and it could be like a fine, reasonable diet. I think where there's interesting nuance is the folks that are looking at a performance perspective. I think from an autoimmune perspective, clearly people are seeing benefit, right? I, I don't think like folks like yourself, folks like Michaela Peterson, who have really resolved a lot of their autoimmune issues, like there's some signal there, right? I think to dismiss it is 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 foolish i think is overly arrogant to be like oh these are these are weird n equals ones i don't believe it. it's like I, I, there's been enough signal there at least from my estimation that there's something real from a autoimmune and potentially neurological perspective right something on the psychiatric side. there's something happening there but on the performance side i have less confidence or i'm, I'm curious i think it's more speculative on the performance side um what is your thought on that? I mean, I think even with carnivore or, or low carb athletes, a lot of the folks that, you know, we talk with or work with, they'll use like simple carbohydrate before competition to get a maximal performance. Um, I'm curious to get your thoughts, nuance on the maximal performance side, which I do understand is orthogonal to health and, and, and everything <laughs> else, right? Well, it can be. I once saw, do you know Peter Defty? He works with endurance athletes, and he gave a talk at KetoCon a couple of years ago in which he was basically arguing that carbohydrates are, are in, in many levels of analysis, like a performance-enhancing drug. Yep. Um, and I'm sure many of the reasons are obvious. And, and that makes it um, – that makes – that gives it a whole different frame of reference, right? If you're going to use something strategically, then that that's very different from um, what what you're going to get if you're trying to focus on um, longevity, for example. Yep. And I'm not sure I have um, much to add really to that conversation. I have, since I've been around in forums for a while um, with people who are doing carnivore diets, one thing that I have seen is that there are people who have, who have said that they, they perform better in terms of their endurance running or in terms of their um, weightlifting. Um, but it doesn't seem to be tied directly to ketosis and so the mechanisms really aren't really aren't very clear to me unless it's just it's just a matter of putting less stress on the body such that you can focus all of your stress in a strategic way in the exercise form and you're not getting any um, any compounded stress that's interfering with your ability to recover or to make the best use of that fair enough i mean i think a lot of the top athletes that we speak and work with they'll always cycle they'll do periodizations of low carb and having carbs right and i think that's like again going back to hormesis or adaptation you want to induce adaptations at the right time because again i think i think there's that orthogonality of 
going for a health span or, or longevity versus peaking for Saturday, December 2nd, I got to break the world record. And you know, you need to be maximal for that specific day, right? It's a very different uh, problem set and, a, and a op- like a, a goal to optimize for. There is something interesting that is that is a difference between carnivore and keto in that way. And that's because of that protein element. Yep. So you can, you can actually kind of all, if you manage the timing of your meals, for example, you can on a purely carnivore diet go for a long period in which you're not eating, even if it's just like all day or a day and a half or something, and then eat a huge bolus of protein. And you're going to get a very different effect than you would get if you were trying to just maintain ketosis at at a low level uh, round the clock. Um, and it it isn't exactly the same as a kind of like carb cycling, but I think that there are some similarities because you're getting this anabolic hit that is going to involve insulin and mTOR, but also protein and and everything that you need to to build your body. Um, and you can do that within the context of a carnivore diet in a way that it that a purely, if you're aiming for ketosis is your kind of highest value, you may or may not get. I, I once had a conversation with Ron Rosedale about this. I don't know how familiar you are with his work, but he yeah. advocates very strongly for for the lowest protein that you can possibly have in order to keep your your ketosis as high as possible in order to facilitate what he believes is the longevity properties of that. And what I said to him was that... <laughs> Um, if you're talking about um, the the scientific background of a lot of that research comes from other animals who appear to have a trade-off between longevity and reproduction. Um, and, and so like the canonical nematode worms are going to actually put off the ability to reproduce until they detect environmentally that there is enough food to actually carry, well, <laughs> not carry, but, you know, uh, have a, a, re- a reproductive success. Yep. I don't think that those results actually translate very well to humans when it's been looked at. But even if they did, if I were just thinking from a personal level, um, the kind of life that I want to live, uh, yes, I want it to be long, but I want to have very strong vitality in all of the senses that we associate with reproductive success. And if that's going to shorten my life, I'd, I'd kind of rather have a more uh, vital, virile kind of existence while I'm alive than to have um, a, a long lifespan where I don't feel very energetic or have high libido. So I think you bring up an interesting point around perhaps some of the considerations to how to properly implement or think about carnivore in the context of health span and longevity. So perhaps to go through a quick list of attacks or critiques of why carnivore might not be optimal and maybe just break down how you think about it. So we talk, you, you mentioned mTOR and I think the, some of the, there's some literature and some folks would argue that Leucine, a branching amino acid, essentially protein, uh, activates mTOR, and mTOR is a, one of the main precursors for an anabolic signal. But oh, there's been tremendous studies showing that inhibiting mTOR through drugs, through fasting, uh, extends lifespan, right? Um, so how do you think about, obviously, ramping up a lot of protein with a carnivore. And I think the, 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 the folk that you, the, the person you cited also, it seems like I have, have a similar idea. You want to have the minimum mTOR or minimum protein threshold for the minimum amount of mTOR activation, which I presume is probably one of the main mechanisms that he's trying to control for. So is, is that really just devolving the argument that, Hey, we're trying to balance health span and longevity. And there's different ways to control for mTOR. If you just do, you know, fasting, um, and I think there's also some other literature suggesting that mTOR is not as is not triggered without a high load of insulin, anyways. So perhaps if you don't eat carbohydrate with your protein, the mTOR problem is not as stark as one we might suspect. 
how would you break that down? The way I would approach the mTOR question, I've I've already kind of alluded to, and yeah. that has to do with frequency. So most of the, if not all of the research that's been done on the benefits of fasting, so if you think of Walter Longo, for example, it's done in the context of a high-carb diet. And so their idea of how much fasting you have to do to get longevity benefits comes down to something like, um, a suggested protocol of five days in a row of fasting once every month to get the the, the total autophagic renewal of all your cells, right? Yeah. But if you think about what they're doing when you do a five-day fast when you're on a high-carb diet, you're spending two or three of those days getting into ketosis before you're before you're really getting those benefits. Yeah. So if you're on a carnivore diet, it may be the case that I ate two pounds of steak and now my ketones are down to 0.5 millimoles or something, right? But 0.5 millimoles is already, according to Finney, for example. Yeah, it's nutritional ketosis. The level of, it's yeah. nutritional ketosis. So, so maybe I'm not going to get maximal longevity benefits at that level. But then the question is, how long do I have to fast if my starting point is 0.5 millimoles before I'm going to get these benefits that take a high-carb advocate five days to get into? And and although I certainly don't have concrete numbers, I don't have a lab to test this, I'm going to suggest it's like a day. <laughs> Even overnight, you're going to be at the levels that it would take days to get to, to get these benefits that have been clinically shown to be relevant. So... So my kind of biased answer is that if you're already on a carnivore diet, you can get you can get these pendulum swings within the course of a week that would take a high carb diet or many days in a row of suffering really yeah. to get to um in order to switch between phases whereas you you can get a huge anabolic hit and then the next day already be doing um beautiful ketosis level, low mTOR fasting like benefits in all likelihood. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, right? You basically skip the glycogen depletion phase, which takes upwards of a couple, one, two days, right? Which is, yeah, right. so you just basically jump start into like a three-day fat, like a third day of a fast if you are on a low-carb keto or carnivore diet. Um, fiber is also like one of those interesting questions where it's been drilled into our brains that you need fiber to have bowel movements. And I think that was like the f fun, most interesting part of my own personal experience with carnivore. It's like, okay, I'm literally going to just eat like two ribeye steaks a day. Like, I wonder what's going to happen. People are like, oh, you're going to just be constipated the whole time. And I had fairly normal bowel movements. But I don't think that's like the, the, the main critique. I think there's like this whole notion of the gut microbiome. You need to feed it all these pre, post by, uh, probiotics. Uh, these these uh, these healthy gut bacteria like these fibers as a substrate. Uh, why is this potentially less important uh, or is not a problem when one is considering a diet with zero fiber? I don't want to downplay the excitement and possibilities of things we're learning about the microbiome and how important it can be and the signals that it can send. But I do think that <laughs> the kinds of claims and statements that have been made about it go beyond the evidence in a way that's very similar to epidemiology in mm. that if you want to know what a healthy microbiome is, basically you should say it's the biome of a of a healthy person, right? You have to start somewhere. So I think a lot of preliminary work has been done in in measuring different strains of different bacteria and associating that with different kinds of health conditions. And that's sort of the starting point of, oh, these strains or this kind of biome profile is what we know maps to a healthy person. But <laughs> the thing the thing is that the biome changes very can change very drastically if you change the kinds of food that you're feeding it. Yep. And if if in the same way that epidemiology for say heart disease biomarkers has all been based on you know, people eating a high-carb grain-based diet, if you suddenly are looking at the microbiome of someone who's not eating any grains or and not eating any plants at all, and you see a series of different strains that would be 
definitely a signal of ill health for someone who is eating grains. I think it's a huge logical leap and an inappropriate one to say that we know for sure that those strains would cause ill health. It's kind of like the ketoacidosis thing, right? Yes, if you see ketosis in a in a high carb grain eater, that's a big sign of trouble. But if you see it in someone who's not eating any carbohydrate, that's a completely different situation. Yep. So I while I think there can be a lot to be learned for the microbiome and, and the effects of different kinds of bacteria, I think we really ought to be cautious about claiming causality at this state in our knowledge. I think that's my sense of the gut microbiome as well. It very much evolves and adapts to the substrate that you feed it, right? And it sounds like you, you, you quite turn over it quite quickly. I haven't done this myself, but I, I've seen other people's N equals ones where their gut microbiome from a standard Western diet turns over quite quickly after, you know, a few weeks on a keto or a carnivore diet where you're essentially starving out, you know, bacteria that might thrive off of fiber to things that might thrive off of butyrate or, or short chain fatty acids, right? You're just, you're just selecting for what sub, you know, a population that thrives off of what kind of substrate that you're offering it. Right. And there's also this idea that short chain fatty acids like butyrate are only obtainable through plant fibers. And it just turns out that that's not really true. If you, I, I did look at one experiment in dogs where they gave them a completely meat based diet and compared it with a plant-based diet and the short chain fatty acid measurements that came out the other end were pretty much identical in both cases. And that's because there are many, there are many different strains of bacteria that can generate butyrate and they're not necessarily plant fiber dependent. And not only that, but um, there, there are bacteria that themselves um, generate butyrate from eating, say, the um, the mu part of the mucosal lining. Well, if you look at Acromantia mucinophila, for example, is the one I'm thinking of in particular, um, it's considered, even by conventional standards, to be a sign of good health and associated with um, good outcomes. It goes way up when you're fasting, so obviously it's not <laughs> it's not coming from um, something that you're eating to feed it, and it turns out that it's actually um, cleaning cleaning up <laughs> the the mucosal lining. There was some worry so, uh, at some point that maybe they would just continue to eat it, and you would have no more colon left. But I don't think that that's turned out to be true. And yet they provide butyrate, which then in turn feeds the colon. So there there are many different ways that those things can be achieved, um, not necessarily the way that it happens when you're on a high-carb diet. Yeah. Going back to your original point is that it's definitely an exciting area of research and hopefully we, you know, the broader scientific community, we can we can learn more about the, how this intersects with, you know, the gut-brain communication. I think that's a very intriguing area to, to explore. So maybe popping back up to a little bit just more on practical tips and and the kind of future directions here. So you've been living the, a carnivore zero carb lifestyle for the last 10 years. Um, any like learnings, lessons and in, in how to implement this? I know, I know that this is a bigger community when there's sub communities of carnivore now where people have this notion of, oh, you have to have grass fed versus grain fed. You can only eat ruminants. You can't you know, avoid seafoods. Um, does cheese and milk and dairy count or is, is that okay? Um, well, there's obviously all these variations. And again, I think from my perspective, as someone that doesn't really seem to have any intolerance issues with some of the you know plant matters and all of the stuff, I think it's, it matters less for me, <laughs> but I'm curious for, from your perspective, um, you know, what are some best tips and ideas and, and guidance uh, as, as broadly speaking as possible here, or, and maybe just to make it personal, like, what do you do? Like, what do you do now that you might have not done 10 years ago? The first thing I would say is you have to modulate it around your own personal goals. So if you're, if you, if you suspect that you might have some plant sensitivities or that you might fare well in a carnivore diet because you've got X or Y condition that you know people have been talking about. I think the first most important thing to 
do is give it a fair trial. A, a lot of people think that they can do a diet that's mostly carnivore and then draw conclusions from that. I mean, you can draw conclusions from it, but most of us who have had um, benefits, clear benefits, and I'm not talking about did that help me or did it not, I'm not really sure, like clear benefits, really were astonished at the minute amount of plant matter that could be the difference between ha actually having a benefit and not. So mm -hmm. if you're going to go through all the trouble of restricting your diet to find out if it's going to help you, don't add the spices in the sauce. Don't have like a salad one day and, and write it off. Like find out for sure if it's going to, if it's going to help you. And then if you do get benefit from it, that's clear and you can tell then like, Really, it's the world is your oyster. It's it's up to you to decide. Like, I have a friend who, back from the early days, who discovered uh, through the same like I'm going to lose weight idea. She discovered that her both her asthma and her arthritis went into remission when she stopped eating plants. And one the first year. On Thanksgiving, she said, well, you know, I'm going to have some Brussels sprouts because I really like them and it's just Brussels sprouts, you know, and she had them and she was in immediate arthritic pain for the next week. <laughs> um, so, but even so, even if you find out I can't eat Brussels sprouts without this pain coming back, if you love Brussels sprouts, that's your decision to make, right? So yep. once you've determined what your baseline sort of best result outcome is, everything else is up to you. And I think that there's a lot of sort of shaming and purity that can go on within diet circles. And I really want to differentiate from that and say, this is about you making the trade-offs that give you the, the most pleasure <laughs> and the most um, ability for you to meet your goals at the same time. And where that falls for you might be different from where it falls for me. The other thing that I think people make a mistake with, and especially if they're coming from the weight loss perspective, is that they try to combine things that they learned from other places like calorie restriction. Yeah. And I think that that can backfire really, really badly because part of the benefit that I've seen personally with a, myself and a lot of other people is that really, really nourishing your body can have better health outcomes in the long run, including weight loss, than, than putting yourself on the edge of not enough all the time. Because I think, I don't want to anthropomorphize the body too much, but I think the body be, is unwilling to go into the state of we're going to build you up and make you your best you now until we know that there is going to be the material for it. And the, and, and tying along with that, you can really learn to trust your own appetite in a way that I think when, when you're on a, maybe on a higher carb diet or maybe, maybe it just has to do with hyper palatable foods, but, yep. but there are a lot of foods that really interfere with your whole appetite mechanism. And you don't know if you're eating this, do I really, I probably actually don't need this and I'm eating it because it tastes so good or because I'm just hormonally driven and I can't stop. And having had that experience makes it hard sometimes to trust, you know, you know, there's this idea, oh, you've got to stop when you're 80% there because your signals aren't really actually right. And one thing that I've learned and a lot of people I know have learned through the carnivore diet is that the signals actually are right. And it stands to reason, right? What kind of animal would have evolved to have signals that don't match up with how much food you actually need? <laughs> so if you're giving yeah. it the food that it's expecting, those things start to actually work. Yeah, I think the nutrient sensing, it, it doesn't it doesn't stand a reason why this would be evolutionarily faulty. And I think it does make sense with hyper palatability of foods. Like, okay, you just eat a bunch of donuts and like it tastes really good. It should be nutriently dense if they're so, so tasty in, in the wild. But it's just like empty fat and carb calories. It's, you're, you're tricking the, the appetites or, or the nutrient sensing pathways from a, I guess, like a taste appetite perspective. And I think, I think it, what you said in terms of people's personal goals, I think is, I think hopefully part of the reason why people tune into more longer form conversations like this, where I think the path that you found yourself on was through self-experimentation. I mean, I think that's the path I came to like my protocols. It's not like, oh, I want to match some gurus or some, 
magical diet book. I, I think it's like we maybe were inspired by the principles, the mechanisms of actions to get there. But ultimately, you know, your state is different from my state, which is going to be different from our listeners' state. And we might have different goals, right? Like if you're trying to be a bodybuilding world champion versus a marathon runner versus resolving metabolic syndrome or resolving psychiatric issues or, or whatnot, those are a little bit of different variants that we should consider as we're, we're as we're putting in uh, together our o- own personal journeys through this life. Yeah, yeah, it turns out I'm not very good at following authorities for better. Or for worse. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's that's the way you make progress because I think no authority has been 100 percent right. I, I think that would be almost like the lesson to learn from history. When has any authority been 100 percent right? Like no one, right? Like you know Einstein, because is is you know. People are looking at, you know, quantum mechanics on top of Einstein. And you know, Einstein corrected Newton. These are some of the smartest people ever in history, right? And it's like, it would be arrogant to think that any single authority living today is 100% right on everything. Like, if someone thinks that they're 100% right, like, all right, cool. Like, maybe you are a demigod of, of, of a, a special pearl of humanity. But I don't, I don't know. Not likely that you're 100% right. You know, that reminds me not to be too geeky, but I can remember going to a, a seminar at a conference on computational linguistics a, about a decade or 15 years ago, even maybe. And uh, the topic was uh, grammatical induction. So you're trying to uh, look at a sequence of language and try to just automatically, without any outside knowledge, determine um, structure out of it, which is a fascinating problem. And w- what the speaker said is, you to to succeed at something as difficult as this you have to have a combination of arrogance and humility so humility that there have been brilliant minds working on this um maybe even more brilliant than you for a long time and they haven't come up with the perfect solution but at the same time you've got to have the arrogance that maybe you do have some new piece of information or some new perspective that that could allow you to be the one who solves it <laughs> Yeah, so it's probably like the right way to live life, right? Like be hum- be humble, but like have that confidence to to shake things up if you if you have a nose for it. Um, so, wrapping up here, uh, what's what's on your roadmap? Obviously, you've given talks um, about about the areas of research. I mean, what are you looking forward to personally in the low carb or carnivore movement over the next year or two? Just looking at a little bit on your on your calendar and your schedule and your plans. Thanks for asking. I, I gave a lot of talks over the last year, almost to the point of burnout, and almost every talk was a, a new one. So yeah. I talked about the role of an- anecdotes. I talked about measurements of quality that lead us to pitfalls like the word nutrient density. And I talked about um, evolution and I talked about hormesis and I talked about mTOR. <laughs> and and now I have no more talks on the docket and all of my focus is going to go into two things that I really want to achieve in the before the year is even half out. One is to finish the book that I've been writing, which I'm releasing online chapter by chapter uh, at facultativecarnivore.com. Exciting. And And the other one is the second annual carnivore conference. I made the first one in Boulder this past March, and we're doing it again in May. We have, I decided to open um, it to submissions for talks because I wanted to give people who I didn't know were doing relevant research to have a chance to show us what they're coming up with. And that's going to happen in May. And I'm very excited about that too. They'll definitely share out those links for folks that might be interested. So where do folks find you? I know you're on social. Um, where do people stay up to date on, on your day to day? I do spend way too much time, particularly on Twitter. My handle's <laughs> Keto Carnivore and uh, I'm pretty responsive there. I have a couple blogs, but I think they can also be found from the Twitter account. It was fun to explore some of the nuances that don't get typically covered with just like, oh, you know, a carnivore diet. What are you eating and uh, are you dead? So uh, <laughs> fascinating to, to dive into some of the science and, and, and also I think some of the maybe more philosophical approaches of how we should even approach questions like these. Likewise, yeah, it's a great pleasure to get to talk to someone who, who gets the basics and wants to move to the more subtle um, points of conversation. Yeah. So I thank you for that. All right, pleasure. All right, thanks so much. If you're interested to learn more about HVMN, visit www.hvmn.com slash pod. Thank you for tuning in.